dear friend Emile Bruneau was originally slated to give this talk. He directed Penn's Peace and Conflict Neuroscience Lab, whose mission is to use scientific methods to figure out what works to reduce violence and increase peace in the world. But a little less than two years after he was diagnosed with brain cancer, this fall, Emile completed what his daughter Clara asked us to call his transition to magic. As the New York Times beautifully summarized, Emile's research spread light and empathy around the globe. This talk is a collaboration with Emile, using ideas that he outlined about how science can make the world a more peaceful and just place. In my time living and working and traveling overseas, I had a number of experiences that, that have informed the research that I do now. But there was really one <laughs> that will never let me go. When I went to Ireland during the Troubles, I went there to volunteer at a conflict resolution camp. And this is a camp that brings together Catholic and Protestant kids for kind of shared experience. After three weeks of this experience, after me, a bunch of the counselors, and a bunch of the kids had left, a fight broke out between two boys. And it immediately split the group down partisan lines, and there was a full-scale brawl between the kids. I went away from this experience wondering what the hell we had just done. Right? That, that we went here with all these great intentions and wonderful intuitions about what would be effective to, to decrease you know, hostility between these groups. And I really think that we actually made things worse. Our intuitions aren't necessarily the best guides of what's gonna work, especially in intergroup conflict. So I think one of the important things about this research is it challenges our intuitions and might give us a more effective way forward. After Emile was diagnosed with brain cancer, when friends and loved ones visited their home, the Brunos invited us to add a piece of yarn to a loom set up in their living room. Together, we constructed a multicolored tapestry with strands as warm wishes from each of us to wrap around Emile. Many of us were new to the art form, but one special thing about Emile and his family is that they patiently helped us figure out how to participate, even if it meant a few tries weaving and unweaving to get it right. In fact, taking mistakes and trying to figure out how to help us all do better is part of what guided Emile's life's work. After experiences traveling and connecting with people in conflict regions around the globe, Emile noticed common threads in the thoughts and concerns that people had, despite the vastly differing tapestries of history and context where they were situated. He saw firsthand how high the stakes are for intergroup conflict, ranging from who gets job opportunities and who gets incarcerated, to other forms of violence in war. Emile realized that he and we get things wrong about other people and other groups all the time. And whereas many of us might feel uncomfortable with that realization, Emile saw it as an important opportunity. He knew that a single intervention can't undo all of the threads at once. And in many cases, we're working not only against biases woven into our individual minds, but also bigger ropes woven into the fabric of our society deliberately to benefit some and not others. So Emil devoted his life to developing and testing tools to identify and unravel the pieces of our mental tapestries that lead to harmful bias, and developing tools to motivate us to change policies that could systematically unstitch those bigger ropes as well. In thinking about how to approach this problem before becoming a neuroscientist, like many of us, Emile assumed that the brain's job was simply to take in information through the senses and give us as accurate a readout of the world as possible to guide our thoughts and actions. As neuroscientists, though, we know that our brains don't always care about accuracy or truth. They care about survival. And to that end, they've been shaped over the course of evolution for efficiency not fidelity. In fact, if you look behind the scenes, our brains are full of prior assumptions, shortcuts, and biases. We can see this at play in the visual system with what we call optical illusions. For example, these circles have the illusion of three-dimensionality. This reveals a prior that's held by our brains, that our main light source will be from above, the sun. So anything that's lit on top 
and shaded below must be a bump, and anything that's shaded above and lit from the bottom must be an indentation. Our brains are also so hyper-attuned to facial expressions that our brains see faces even when they're not there. Why might our visual system be biased in these ways? Well, the answer is pretty simple for visual illusions. Biases are mental shortcuts that help the brain work faster, and brains that are able to distinguish this lion from its background immediately, or at least faster than the brain of the poor creature standing next to them, aren't eaten. So having biases that allow the brain to take shortcuts and work faster helped our ancestors stay off the menu. But biases aren't limited to the visual system. Biases in how we process sound allow us to identify our caregivers at a very young age, and biases also extend to how we process broader information about other people. Have you ever noticed that anyone driving slower than you is a moron, and anyone driving faster than you is a maniac? George Carlin used this line in his comedy, but it's also a well-known self-serving bias. We tend to attribute anything bad that I do to the situation. I'm driving too slow because I'm lost. I'm driving too fast because I'm late for an important appointment. But we attribute anything bad that others do to their disposition, being a moron or a maniac. This attribution bias also applies to groups. Just like the brain's visual system takes shortcuts, humans bias tendency to categorize people into groups and then give preference towards those who are closest to us or who we perceive as most relevant or similar is so strong that we can even conjure group identities out of thin air. Research shows that if I were to give a random half of you a red shirt to wear and the other half a blue shirt to wear, red and blue shirters would start self-segregating. And being part of these two groups would start to shape our thoughts where red and blue shirters would think of people from their newly anointed groups as more intelligent, more trustworthy, and even more attractive than those from the opposite group. And this is true even if it's revealed at the outset that the group designations are completely arbitrary. As with our optical illusions, some of us may not have given a lot of thought to the initial source of these social biases. Yet, over time, as we engage the same mental shortcuts about me and my group, and you and your group, the threads of these thoughts and mental shortcuts get strengthened and reinforced and connected to other threads and enmeshed in our thinking. This leaves us with a tangled set of illogical, irrational, and often unfair assumptions and beliefs about other groups that in many cases are reinforced by systems of inequality. But fortunately, we also have minds and brains that can be rewired and in fact are fundamentally optimized to change. So how does this immense potential for change express itself in us? What kinds of change does it allow in our beliefs about others? Emile believed that if what we know to be true of other groups is connected in a web to irrational biases, then challenging key assumptions about other groups might be one way to find pieces of thread that we can pull on to help unweave our biases. For example, in one study that I collaborated on with Emile and Noor Kateli, it started with an observation. When a diverse group of non-Muslim Americans were asked how responsible Muslims are for an act of violence by Muslim extremists, they blamed Muslims about three times as much as they blamed Christians for an equally horrific act of violence by Christian extremists. This is one example of hypocrisy that arises from our social biases. Many of the folks answering these surveys probably hadn't thought much about the hypocrisy and our tendency to blame one group, but not the other. So the team created a simple activity to help people identify threads they could pull on individually and to push for change in society through the policies they support. Here's what happened in the activity. First, participants learned about a series of horrific acts perpetrated by extremists, such as a white nationalist Norwegian who committed acts of terrorism, killing 77 people and wounding over 300, and citing his white identity as a motivation for the attacks. After each of these true stories, we asked how responsible the bigger group, in this case white people, in general are for the acts of this extremist, and how responsible they thought they were personally for these actions. 
Then we turned the question around and described acts by Muslim extremists and asked how responsible Muslim people in general are for the acts of the extremists, as well as how much to hold individual Muslims accountable. Finally, we asked how much they supported different anti-Muslim policies. What we found was that this simple activity of highlighting hypocrisy and blaming one group but not the other first causes people to reduce the amount they blamed Muslim people in general for the acts of extremists compared to people who didn't do the exercise. Critically, it also reduced their support for anti-Muslim policies. Emil and collaborators then replicated these findings in Spain and showed that not only did the activity reduce collective blame of Muslims as a group and reduce support for anti-Muslim policies, the idea stayed with people and they still reported less collective blame of Muslims and less support for anti-Muslim policies a month later and a year later when the research team followed up. Of course, any one study or intervention takes only a small step forward. For example, noticing that collectively blaming other groups while not taking responsibility for our own is hypocritical is just one small stitch we can grab a hold of in the larger tapestry of our biases. In addition, at the same time that we try to reduce collective blame for marginalized groups, in this case reducing Islamophobia, Emil, his collaborators, and many others are also building on the decades and centuries of research and work by scholars of color, activists, and peace builders to encourage people from dominating groups, such as white Americans, to recognize our individual and collective responsibility to unravel the systems of advantage that we benefit from and reweave a society that's more equitable. Emil's research also shows that people whose groups have the most power benefit from actively listening to and reading stories from people from marginalized groups, whereas people who are part of marginalized groups benefit more from being heard. Finally, Emile's work and the work of many others shows that our assumptions about members of other groups are reliably false. So what can we do when our biases poke into conscious awareness, like a stray thread of thought, as when we notice that it was hypocritical to blame one group and not another, or when we assume that members of another group don't like us. A common response might be terror, defensiveness, push it back down. But Emil and the activists, peace builders, and scholars whose work he admired would encourage the opposite. Actively look for and notice the pieces of stray thread of thought that you can grab onto. You can see stray threads in the moments when a racist or sexist or homophobic or anti-Semitic thought or comment comes into your conscious awareness as you go about your day. In those moments, you're being provided with insight into how your brain is working and a reminder of the importance of doing this work. Instead of tamping down the stray thread, grab a hold and pull. What's that thread connected to? It's connected to a whole system of threads and ropes that uphold racism and sexism and other biases. And one of the ways to unweave our own bigotry is to pull hard on that thread and push for change in the systems that we're part of. We can pull on these threads by getting better at facing discomfort. Getting involved with organizations and groups where we meet and develop relationships with people from other communities, listening openly, not making snap judgments, and actively taking time to untangle the web of our own biases. This unraveling then makes space to allow our brains the opportunity to change, to rewire, to learn, and to grow as a community. I'll leave you with Emile's words. So this is, a, this is a tough fight against intergroup conflict. But isn't it worth that type of effort? Isn't it worth that type of fight? You know, we know the realities of conflict. By all projections, that kind of suffering is going to increase. I am trying to say that, that my, my goal, our goal, should be, should be more dramatic than just um, doing good science, although that's, that's important and wonderful and good. But, but we have the potential to do more. You have the potential to walk through darkness and spread light. And, uh, and, and the nice thing is that that, <sighs> this force is in us and communal. It's not owned. And, and 
Uh, and, and the best way to activate a communal force is to be a community. <laughs> so that, that's, that's why we're here.